Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, my name is June Carthew. <laughs> Sorry, I hope you didn't hear that. It was my computer telling me something. I'm not sure what. Um, I do apologise if there's any background noise. Um, I'm trying to minimise the noise here, but it's not all under my control. So, care project, the software tools. I'm going to just go through these slides giving you the background to the project and then I'll demonstrate the software tools. Housekeeping, please make sure you set um, whatever device you're using to mute, please. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't answer the question during or after the webinar. You could email any questions to me and then what I'll do is I'll put together a big Q and a Q and a and share that with everyone who's registered. The email address is there. And um, if you could notice it now, or you'll be getting it because I've got your email addresses to your event site registration. Well, we hope recording the webinar, and then we'll be sharing the recording um, and putting it on the Wessex AHSN website afterwards, as long as it's worked. I've had interesting experiences trying to record um, previously. So just keep this crossed. And we'll be um, sending out a short survey to you all afterwards um, to get your opinion on the tools. It'd be very nice to have your feedback. So, care project, just background. It was in September 2015, a joint project um, supported by HEE in Wessex and um, the Clinical Senate because of all pressures facing general. Practice. I'm sure that you're all aware of what's going on and has been going on, and I'm sure you're all having to deal with these things yourself in your edits. Um, there's a, it was a team just of two. Me, um, I'm a project manager. I don't have a clinical background. And um, a Hampshire GP. Uh, having said a GP, um, he has been over the past. He's worked in PCT. He's worked in the area team as well as being a GP in, in Hampshire many years. So he knows a lot of people just want to have one of the projects. But it may just be the two of us, but we've had huge input and support from our colleagues, um, including our colleagues in health education and the emerging CPEN, and our LMC and um, people in the area team at NHS England. Uh, we were facing how can we make general practice more sustainable with all the issues around the increasing and aging population and the more demanding population, the increased workload when we don't have enough staff. And results, our findings were, not surprisingly, there is no single solution, there is no mag magic bullet. But just like the UK cycling team, we think that marginal gains will take you towards the gold medal. Um, you can tweak a few things here and there, that does add up as it can make quite a significant difference thing is to stop the duplication of administrative work which should be done by others, for example, hospital um, staff writing sick notes and, and various things like that. And some of these things are not in the new contract, but our colleagues in secondary care aren't always following the contract, and it does put a lot of pressure on GPs, and it's not, but not fair on the patients. Work efficiently in so many different ways can help. So, delegation of internal admin work to trained up staff. If you don't have to open every single, read every single letter every day, if it's someone else can do an initial read through, that, that will save time. Um, increased telephone consultations and the use of technology, for example, web consultations. The area, though, we feel is to invest in other staff and have a broader, wider, multidisciplinary workforce. Because we're not going to get those 5,000 extra GPs or however many it was that we were promised in time. Um, but there are plenty of people who can do a lot of things within to practice in primary care and support the patients. We have a short report published, and there's a link there. Um, it's available on the Wessex AHSN website as well. Thinking about the wider workforce, the first thing that Stuart and I did was to take a survey, a very simple survey of Wessex GPs to see what their thinking was. And start perhaps people thinking about the possibilities of using additional staff. 
Um, it was simply to respond whether the patient that the team had just seen could have been seen and appropriately managed by another healthcare professional, yes or no. And we gave a handful of different roles to choose from. The risk came back that 75% of the patients seen could have been seen and treated by others. It was a totally subjective survey. It completely relied on the P's own opinion. Uh, case mix that they saw and the culture of the practice. And it's a number of questions. Um, for example, to what the heck can each of these professions do? And the tools come out of this. And we have in mind the scenario of a, a general practice being unable to recruit a new GP. And in that situation, there's still things that they need to treat. Two of these, what other professions? could they use to fill that gap? Then our skills matrix, because from both from the survey, it dawned on that, and also our own research locally, it was clear that, that GPs and practice managers didn't always know what, exactly what each other profession was able to do. And, I mean, why would they? Why would everyone know exactly what a particular type of physiotherapist is capable of, for example? So we developed the skills matrix. It's a massive spreadsheet. Um, it, there's a clear bit on the side, but you will see a big one. Uh, you will see it for real later when I do the demo and in a slightly more readable form. Um, so we developed the skills matrix with all the roles that we've found examples of working in general practice across the top and all the tasks and skills that we think that need to be undertaken down the side. And we've had this verified by colleagues of ours in health education. Uh, so a paramedic has seen has had the paramedic bit, a pharmacist, the pharmacist bit, and so on. We do recognize that this is a work in progress, and we recognize that some people may disagree with it. Um, useful but very unwieldy tools. So we developed a skills query just on top of it. We select a number of skills, and the tool will show you which staff are capable of undertaking that particular set of skills. Also, from the survey, we have the result that 35% of patients could be managed by other staff. But what does it mean? How many patients, how many appointments, and, and how much each staff, how much, how much full-time equipment, how many sessions, and particularly how much should this cost? So the workforce tool to answer these questions. Our um, stress is that any practice who takes the tools should undertake their own survey because we feel that the percentage of patient consultations that could be taken by each profession is very much down to, to local issues. So what sort of patients you have, the demographic mix, what um, staff do you have in the practice, what their special what their, their areas of interest are, so have you got any gypsies, have you got specialist nurses, that sort of thing. Um, the tool that we read about is pre-populated with our survey results. The workforce tool takes an estimate of the number of face-to-face -face GP appointments required in a year um, and calculates that from the patient's list for the practice. It is, it's not a, it's a guess uh, based on uh, historical data. A percentage from the survey of the consultations required for each profession um, entered and the paper band selected, and the tool will then calculate the number of consultations because if you know that you're going to want 10% of us, for example, and you know you've got your estimate of the face to face number of GP appointments, work out the number 10%. Um, then using time per consultation per question, because of course, a nurse, for example, an advanced nurse practitioner, we would expect to take minutes for a consultation, but an extended scope physiotherapist, we'd be looking at 20 minutes. So account calculations for annual leave, average sickness, and so on. The tool will then calculate from that number of consultations what the whole time equivalent of that professional um, would be required. And then if you know the pay band, you can work out the average pay plus add on 20% for on costs. Um, it also shows 
estimate of the space and time saved for a GDP, and please note the quotes there. Um, we're suggesting that GPs will be GPs because of, of using other stars. We are also very conscious that we're at the patient facing time, we're not looking at all the time that a GP spends in the practice. Um, so we're looking at the representation of sync to face to face GP time, uh, and we know that they only spend a proportion of their time in patient, patient consultations and do a lot of other work. So what was the first tool that we developed? Um, it's very, very simple. All, all the tools are very simple. They're not particularly sophisticated, but they do provide a level of support and, and thinking of workforce. Um, the RAG tool was developed to just so that people were aware of what might be happening in two and five years with the workforce. Something that um, some weren't thinking about succession planning. So it highlights age 50 and above. Age 60, it's um, set sessions to zero. So you enter the current age and sessions worked at the moment, and they're carried forward to two and five years. And if someone hits 60 during that time, the sessions are set to zero because that's the average age for retirement for GPs and practice nurses. You can enter in plan sessions. So it, it, it and it gives you, it highlights in red colours the difference between the current sessions that you're providing and planned sessions. Come to the demonstration. Um, I hope I can swap between screens efficiently. So we sign in screen for the tool. You sign in. Let a bit of blurb. Anything in blue is a link. So you can link straight through to other websites or other pieces of information. I strongly recommend that if you're using the tool for the first time you use it, you read the help screens first. So with the red tool, as I said, do look at help screen first. It's, there's, um, it's very straightforward. So in this example, we've got a number of GPs, a number of ages, offering a number of sessions. We can simply add another row by clicking on plus. It wants to GP partner, but you can put in any of the roles that we're looking at in the tools. In. Um, this comes down to you how you use it, but we would suggest you shouldn't mix and pairs, um, but just look at people who are offering the same type of service so you get a true comparison. So we'll in another salary GP. We'll say that this GP is all 56 and that they are currently working five sessions a week. So the five sessions carried forward, and it's two years added on, age 58 in two years' time, and in five years' time, they've reached 61 and they are down to work zero sessions. If everyone, all these five GPs, carry on working the same number of sessions in two years' time that they are now, there's no shortfall and no increase in the number of sessions available. But people change what they want to do for various reasons. They might, for example, here go down from eight to six in the run-in retirement, or um, age five. They might go from seven to five because of, of childcare commitments. Just that if you can get to talk about in your practice and start looking two years and five years ahead, you can start planning to what you're going to do for the shortage of um, sessions. So let's say our doctor is going to carry on with the five sessions a week. Now, in circumstances, um, in an under 60, if it's a different number in here, it would be carried forward to year five. So initially, any, any, any number of sessions entered now is automatically carried forward to plan projected for year two and projected for year five. But then if plan a different number for year two, that's taken to projected for year five. Session where actually this doctor thinks that they won't retire at 60 and they might want
want to carry on. They might retire in quotation marks and take their NHS pension and then come back and um, uh, having to make pension contributions. And let's say I'm uh, going to work four sessions a week. So we just to that. You can see that we're looking at with if both these doctors retire, we're looking at a forty four percent short sessions and we're down from thirty sessions a week now to nineteen there. So something needs to be done. But if these two are not going to retire then we're only looking for a sort of shortfall, but there is a smaller shortfall. But that's all right. Well, but hopefully an a help for people to plan. The skill sets. So we developed the skill matrix because it was clear that um, people didn't have a full understanding of the capability of each different profession. And we developed the table spreadsheet and it is available as part of the tool and we can zoom in so you can get a look at the things you're looking at. As a work in progress it may be that there are other things we need to add to the, the list on the left and there are other professions that we didn't consider that perhaps we should have considered on the right, but we didn't consider them because we didn't find any examples of them working. Um, so that's the skills matrix, and it is quite big. To make it more usable, we query. So we can we can put a whole load of different skills, tasks, whatever you want to call them, into our Gladstone bag, shopping basket. Uh, so if you have a member of the staff who's left, and these are they did they undertook particular things, um, it may be that you can share some of their work amongst your other staff, or it may be that you need to like that. But rather than just saying, John, we need to get another Mary, think about what it is that you actually have a gap in, where you need to, what skills you need, what experience you need, and don't just think it has to be another Mary. It could be um, a Maria or whatever. It could be someone in the fighting colour uniform. So just as an example, we will look at... So, so there's a, a category um, of condition type, and then within the condition type, we have a number of different conditions. And the policies for all the abbreviations, um, this data is pulled straight from our spreadsheet. And because of the spreadsheet, we have to abbreviate quite a lot of things. Um, that's just a feature of how the tool works. So we're at asthma. And who can do partial monitoring of asthma? Um, add that skill into our Gladstone bag. I think it's a nice lot of people who can undertake partial monitoring of asthma. So let's think, do we need to have someone who can or treat asthma. Um, so we now add that in. Quite a bit smaller. We've lost a few people. We've lost the healthcare um, assistant and some other people. But the key member is that these workforce in red on the right are the people who undertake everything that you put in your blood to the So we want to look at the acute exacerbation. And then one again. So this, this is only these people who can take the um, acute probation and manage treatment and partial monitoring of that. Now, I end up with no one here in red. It means that it's only the GPs who can do that particular combination of skills and tasks. If you want to see who you've lost or who we are looking at generally, uh, the square icon. Icon that you'll be able to see all the different roles. I don't know how easy it is to see. It's, it's pale grey on my screen. Um, I don't know whether it translates across or not, but you can see it is out in pale grey the other roles that we've been looking at. Skills query. So we've got skills query. Um, 
So I'm, I will stress, read the help screen first because it's actually more than a help screen. It gives you the background to um, our thinking and some of our calculations. This is the table where we've got the time per consultation per role. I disagree with it. It is, again, a fair work in progress, but we have very good evidence, for example, that the physiotherapist will take 20 minutes, and, and we know that a lot of our advanced nurse practitioners are working up to 10 appointments, the same as uh, the GP. There's links to um, the information that we've used. So the in consultation rates in general practice 2008-9, that is the last national data collection, and that gave us an average number of um, annual consultations by in particular age and sex firms. And we've added that by a known increase in activity over the last um, but factored in also that some of that activity is due to an increase in population. Our survey I was talking about, our survey, this shows you the survey that we sent out with a box at the top giving you information about our results and the breakdown. Um, and that's what we sent out, so you can see that. And we do provide you with a downloadable link here to a, a Word version of that which you can use to make your own survey to customise it because you may want to change the roles, you may want to change other features in it. So the first workforce tool is to enter your data. Uh, you need to enter the demographics, the, the patient list details for your practice. Now, the region that the sex bands that the 2008-9 data is divided into. Unfortunately, they don't actually match necessarily exactly the uh, data that comes out of um, the patient system, um, so you have to fudge it a bit, I'm afraid. But behind each of these is a multiplier which says the average number of face to face appointments per year for this age and sex. So, we example 10,000 patient packages. And the results of, on the right, the results of the um, survey are entered. And it's pre-populated with our HMR survey. So not every not every role actually has anything in it because we didn't include them in the survey because we didn't want to have every single thing there. It would just make the survey too difficult to complete. And also some of these roles we haven't even come across when we sent that survey. But that, this is the agenda for change paper. For this role. Now, we realize that just doesn't use a gender for change pay bands, but it is a useful way of categorizing for and experience and pay. And you find that if you click on, do you remember I said that anything blue gives us a hyperlink? So if we click on one of the job titles, you want that we give you a subset of the Skills matrix. Asked about what, what they can do and where you can get them from and pay band information. So we've got both annual pay and hourly rates for band seven and band eight A, which are the two pay bands that uh, we understand as practitioners, uh, advanced nurse practitioners are generally um, employed at. And about training. That's information for most, if not all, of the workforce types there. So to the advanced nurse practitioner, you'll see that eighteen point five percent here. And that's from our original survey that eighteen point five percent of the patients could have been seen and appropriately managed by the advanced nurse practitioner. But here eight percent. Well, that's because we've got 8% of the band 8, band 7, and then at the band 8A, we've got 10.5%. So the 10.5% at 8A, and 8% at band 7, adds up to 18.5%. So just aware of that, that if you 
people at different bands, you have to click through to see it. Entry screen, and at the bottom it's totaling 35. You remember that our survey came to 35% of that would be seen by other staff. Oh. So for that 10,000 patient practice example, in that particular breakdown of age and sex, we estimate that that will require 40,301 face-to-face GP consultations in a year. 35% of that is just over 14,000, so we're freeing up by another staff, freeing up 14,000 GP consultations which we have calculations for the time and the um, full time in line talked about before. This is over the face-to-face -face consultation. Things to look at is what, what we've calculated in terms of time and cost for the different workforce. So our advanced nurse practitioner band 7 and our advanced nurse mm -hmm. practitioner band A. And these, the, the consultation numbers are calculated on the percentages that were put in on the previous screen. We then translate that to the full-time equivalent, equivalent required, as I said earlier, taking into account things like annual leave and average sickness rates. Translate that into sessions as well. And the cost, as I said earlier, is from the midpoint of the pay band plus 20%. So this is an idea of the cost of each of these having employing all of these together and the cost for each of them. Now these make a lot of sense and some of don't. So having um, 0.44 of an advanced nurse practitioner that's nearly that's nearly half time. You, know, you might want to employ a nurse practitioner for um four or five sessions a week. But clinical pharmacist point one one that's not really a practical amount. And this is where we would encourage you to talk to your neighbouring practices or confederation. Uh, start to think of economies of scale that, that maybe the patients might be enough to support um, a full list or a part-time pharmacist, depending on the results of the survey. Um, so this isn't supposed to be the answer. This is really a, a way of starting to think about what you could do within your practice, but just to give you an idea of the costs um, involved and the amount of time that a number of patient consultations would take take up from a particular profession. So about um, asking the, the full time equivalent for the GP based on an average um, salary for a salary GP and um, the average pay, certainly in Wessex, the partners would get. Um, we estimate that this is much this time. These 40,000 GP consultations would cost you in GP time. So savings, um, again, I think this is probably something that should be in inverted commas, um, but that we're looking at a difference of £79,000 between using EP and using the other staff. I stress again that this this one point three is simply releasing the time that GPs have been sent in ten minute consultations, and so it could you could um, if you capacity you could increase the number of consultations to fifteen minutes with GPs, uh, or if you can't if you can't recruit the one GP, then you've got an idea of how many consultations could be replaced by other professions. And this is the, the demo. Um, I'll just go back to PowerPoint. Remember, if you've got any questions, please email them, and I will put together a question and answer sheet and send it out. So, I guess one of the questions might be how to get the tools. So, uh, I am all powerful, and the tools are available through me. Um, at the moment, it's me who you need to contact. They are free to anyone in Wessex, and they are free to Health Education England staff at Wessex. Um, the tools themselves are free. Um, there's no, I mean, this is completely free, no licensing, no project, no nothing. Um, but just, um, you will need a login. And for people outside of Wessex, 
Statistics and Outside of Health Education England, a login for a one-off charge. How much is that? And I'm afraid we don't know yet, but we will be um, agreeing the amount at a meeting in October. I don't imagine it will be a massive amount. Um, and to make a login, you just need to email me and I will get that sorted. Finally, what next? Um, as I keep saying, please email me any questions and I will respond and share. I will send out the slides and if the recording has worked, a link of the recording um, to everyone who has been registered on the Eventbrite event. I will put together a small survey and send that out to you all to garner your opinions and thoughts about the tool and I would be very, very grateful if you could complete the survey. Finally, Thank you much for joining this webinar, and I hope it's been of interest and use, and has stimulated some thoughts, if nothing else.